Jeff, it's an honor to be a part of this Jesus Habit series. And a few weeks ago, Pastor and I started to work on this sermon together. And when he asked me to be a part of the Jesus Habit series, I was excited but also a little intimidated. I started to pray, Lord, give me a habit that I'm good at because it's easy to preach a habit that you are good at. And when I saw that it was the habit of generosity, I said, oh, Lord, you gave me the habit that I'm the worst at in my mind. And then insecurity started to hit me. I'm like, okay, if I'm going to preach on the habit of generosity and I'm not good at it, maybe these people will think and he's not saved, he doesn't know Jesus, he's not worthy to teach us. And so all these things started to flood my mind. I was like, they're going to judge me. They're going to even think I don't know Jesus. But here's what the Lord said to me. He said, listen, these habits aren't for you to earn your salvation. It's actually an expression of your salvation. So the reason we are learning Jesus' habits is to show people that we want to look like Jesus so that when we live so differently and they look at us, we can teach them the gospel of Jesus. So this is good news for you and me. If you've been in this series and you realize, man, I'm not good at this habit, don't worry. It's okay. Today can be the day. This message could be the message where you say, I'm going to get the habit of generosity right. This was me when I studied this message. And actually, as I was working through this, I realized that I believed a massive lie when it came to the habit of generosity. I'm going to tell you a little more about that later in the message. I'm going to show you how I struggle with generosity, just being honest and open with you today. But I I want you to see the big lie that I believed about generosity, and I want you to see what God taught me. But before we dive in too deep, I want to kind of lay the table, set the table for us to have an understanding of what generosity is. You're going to see this definition on the screen. We define generosity as being intentional in life by offering yourself and your resources on behalf of others in the name of Jesus. So we believe generosity is your intentional in your life by giving yourself, by offering yourself and your resources to others in the name of Jesus. And here's the truth today that I want you to take home. If anyone asks you, hey, what did you learn from church today? If you're watching online, if you're in the room, I hope you can say this. Here's the truth bomb that you need to write down, that you need to memorize, that you need to apply in your life, and it's this. We are never more like Jesus than when we are generous. We are never more like Jesus than when we are generous. Now, when I first heard this statement, I heard it from Pastor Jeff, and I'm kind of a nerd theological scholar. I like to learn. I like to look at things in a theological perspective. I'm like, is that really true that we are never more like Jesus Then when we are generous, and I want to tell you, after studying this message, after working through it, not only do I believe that to be true, but I also believe that if we adapt the habit of generosity in our lives, it could change marriages, it could change relationships, it could change families, it could change your neighborhood, it could change your college campus, your dorms, it could change your region, it could change the Lake Lanier region the gospel of Jesus if we adapt the habit of generosity. Here's what I believe. Generosity is a foundational habit. If we're going to get any habit right, we have to get this one. If this habit means that we look more like Jesus than ever when we are generous, then we can't skip this habit. And I'm not going to lie to you, when I was studying, I was like, whoo, if that statement is true, then Benjamin Garrison has a lot of work to do in his life. I want to show you how I got to believing that this statement is true. First thing I want you to see is that generosity was a habit in Jesus' life. The reason we can say that Jesus was generous is all throughout the Gospels, all throughout Scripture. We see example after example after example of how Jesus was generous to people as he walked on this earth. Now, if I were to read you every passage of Scripture and explain it to you of how Jesus was generous— We would be here for like three hours. And I know it's Labor Day weekend and we don't want to be here for three hours. But I've kind of given you the gold. I went through and looked at the Gospels and said, okay, what are some ways in which Jesus was generous? And I want to show you four specific ways that Jesus was generous in his life while he was on this earth. The first is Jesus gave healing to those who were hurting. 
Jesus gave healing to those who were hurting. In Mark chapter 1, we see the stage set where this man has leprosy. If you don't know leprosy, it's an awful disease. There were sores, boils all over their body, and it was highly contagious. And so because of this, they would take whoever had it, and they would throw them out of society. They would keep them out of their culture, out of their towns, to where you would have leper colonies. Because they would all go to live together because no one could cure leprosy. It was highly contagious. They were unwanted, unworthy. And people believed that those who had this disease had something spiritually wrong with them, that they were unclean. And so these people were outcasts. They were unworthy. They were unwanted. And we see in Mark chapter 1 that this guy comes to Jesus and he's begging Jesus. Leading up to this verse, I'm going to read you. He goes, Jesus, have mercy on me. Jesus, if you are willing, cleanse me and heal me. He runs to Jesus, this man in need, this man who has so much going on, who's unwanted, who's hurting deeply. And look what Jesus says, Mark 1, 41. Moved with compassion, Jesus reached out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, he told him, be made clean. Aren't you so thankful that we have a Savior, the Son of God, the King of kings, the high priest, who looks at people that are hurting and has compassion on them and says, I am willing, be made clean. Another example of this is Matthew 9, verse 27. It says, as Jesus went on from there, two blind men followed him, calling out, have mercy on us, son of David. Have mercy on us, son of David. If you don't know the context for this passage, there's two men and they're crying out to Jesus because they have been blind their whole life and they're wanting healing. And they're saying, Jesus, son of David, please have mercy on me. They're so loud that people around them are like, hush, Stop calling out. You're you're not worthy to call out to him. You're not worthy to get Jesus to spend time with you. Stop. Stop shouting. And they cried all the louder. And in that passage, we know that Jesus had mercy on them. And he healed them. And he let them see. Another verse that's an example of this is John chapter 5, verse 5 and 6. One man was laying there who had been disabled for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and realized he had been there for a long time, he said to him, Do you want to get well? This is another example where Jesus walks to this place. There's this body of water and sick, diseased people would lie around this body of water hoping to be healed. They believed that there was something mystical about the water. And Jesus walks to this place and he sees a man who had been there for 38 years. The first two examples, these these people came running to Jesus and says, heal me, heal me, Jesus. This man was just laying there and Jesus walked and saw his need and said, Do you want to be made well? See, I'm telling you, I could give you example after example after example of how Jesus was generous, giving healing to those who are hurting. But I think Luke 7 sums it up perfectly. It says this, Luke 7, verse 21 and 22. At that time, Jesus healed many people of diseases, afflictions, and evil spirits. He granted sight to many blind people. He replied to them, go and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight. The lame walk, those with leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor are told the good news. Aren't you so thankful that we have a Savior that is willing to heal those who are hurting? You're going to learn about this a little later in the message, but if you're hurting this morning, there's a, the biggest hurt is our spiritual hurt, and, and Jesus says, I am willing to heal you. He is willing to give healing to those who are hurting. The second thing we see of how Jesus is generous throughout the Gospels is Jesus was generous with his time. Jesus was generous with his time. Look what it says in Matthew 19, 13, and 14. Then little children were brought to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and to pray. But the disciples rebuked them. Jesus said, leave the little children alone and don't try to keep them from coming to me because the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. Have you ever seen this theme throughout the Gospels and throughout Jesus' life? That time after time, people tell people, don't waste your time with these people. They're outcasts. They're unwanted. They're unworthy. They're annoying. And even in this passage of Scripture, the disciples are like, no, children, go away. You are just annoying. You're a hindrance. Leave. And Jesus always made time for those who are unwanted, those who are hurting, those who had need, those who were a hindrance, those who were annoying. He was known for eating with tax collectors and sinners. See, Jesus made time, and he was generous with his time. Another example of him being generous with his time, look what it says in Luke chapter 11, verse 1. He was praying in a certain place, 
And when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John also taught his disciples. So this is one of Jesus' disciples coming to Jesus saying, hey, would you teach me how to do this? This is one of the numerous examples that we see in the Gospels where Jesus has to take time out of his day to teach his disciples, to disciple them, to grow them up and how they should live. And I don't know if you know this about his disciples. Do you know their ages? Most scholars believe that the disciples, the 12 that follow Jesus, range from high school age to mid-20s young adults. So Jesus hung out with a bunch of high school and college students. And he enjoyed it and spent three years discipling them, raising them up. Now, if you don't know this about me, I have a unique perspective here at Christ Place. As Pastor Jeff said, I came as the middle school pastor, then served as the high school pastor, then served as one of the next gym pastors and helped with kids ministry. And now I'm serving in college ministry, waiting to launch the North Campus in 2021. And there's been something I've noticed. I'm like, how do some of these leaders serve in kids ministry and student ministry and college ministry year after year after year? Kids are crazy. They're wild. You know, teenagers, they'll go here, they'll go there. Why do they do it? Why does Homer Myers, he's one of our fifth grade teachers, he has served our fifth grade boys each and every year, discipling them to be like Jesus, opening up his home, his his land, so that way they can have events there. How does someone like that do it year after year after year? How does someone like Bryant Wallace serve in student ministry since the foundations of the earth, it seems? How do these people serve in these ministries over and over again? Here's how. They are like Jesus, and they are being generous with their time. When you are generous with your time, it can make an eternal impact. And when you are generous with your time, you're being like Jesus. And don't forget those that the world and culture wants to forget. Because that's who Jesus made time for. I could spend all day on this one point, but we got to move on. The next thing I want you to see is that Jesus was generous to his enemies. Jesus was generous to his enemies. It's easy to say, hey, I'm going to be generous to those who need help. Those who are hurting, it's kind of easy. I mean, you have to be a heartless person to say, oh, I'm not going to help those who are hurting. So it's easy to do that. It's easy to be generous to those who are children or to young youth. I mean, that's, that's a little bit easier. But when it comes to your enemies, that's a hard group of people to be generous to. That's extremely, but Jesus took it to the next level. And he was even generous to his enemies. And I want to show you how he was. Look at Matthew 26, verse 48 through 50. His betrayer had given them a sign. The one I kiss, he's the one. Arrest him. So immediately he went up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. In verse 50, Jesus said, Friend, why have you come? This is one of the most dramatic scenes where Jesus is about to be arrested. And one of his own 12 disciples, one of his own 12, the the men that he spent three years teaching, taking time to invest in, one of his own 12 stabbed him in the back and betrayed him. And Jesus knew all along that Judas was going to betray him. Yet Judas still ate at the table of Jesus. And even in the moment of betrayal, I would have a lot more words to say than Jesus did. But Jesus just simply says, friend. It should give you chills that in looking your betrayer eye to eye, and he says, friend, why have you come? See, Jesus was even generous to those who betrayed him. And in the same scene, as he's being betrayed, there's a group that comes to arrest him. And one of the servants of the guards who are there to arrest him go to lay a hand on Jesus. And one of his disciples pulls out a sword and cuts the servant's ear off. Now, if I'm Jesus and someone's about to arrest me to take me to my death, I'd be like, go ahead, Peter, get the other ear. You know, I'd be like, go after him. Protect me. It's time. But that's not what Jesus does. What does Jesus do? Luke 22, 51. But Jesus responded, No more of this. He stops the violence. He reaches down and he heals him. He says, in touching his ear, he healed him. See, Jesus was generous to his betrayer. Jesus was generous to his arrester, to those who are arresting him. And then look at this, Luke 23, 34. Jesus was generous to those who crucified him. As Jesus is on the cross, after he's been beaten, as he's gotten the the crown of thorns on his head, as he's bleeding out on the cross, this is what he says. He says, Father, forgive them, Luke 23, 34. Forgive them because they do not know what they are doing. And as Jesus is bleeding and crying out for forgiveness of those who have shouted, 
crucify him, crucify him. He's asking for their forgiveness. He's giving them forgiveness and asking that that they would be forgiven from the Father. And as he's asking for their forgiveness, look what it says in the verse. And they divided his clothes and were casting lots. That's the generosity of our Lord and Savior, Jesus. He was even generous to his enemies. And I want to show you the next couple of passages of Scripture. There's one more enemy he was extremely generous to. Do you know who that enemy is? Me and you. Let me show you. Romans 5.10. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, then how much more having been reconciled will we be saved by this life? This says that while we were enemies with God, that means while we hated God, while we hated his law, while we didn't want salvation from him, that even though we were his enemies, God loved us. Us. Look what Ephesians 2, 1 through 5 says. And you were dead in your trespasses and sin, in which you previously walked according to the ways of this world, according to the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit now working in the disobedient. We too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts. And we were by nature children under wrath, as the others were also. But God who is rich in mercy because of his great love that he had for us, made us alive with Christ even though we were dead in trespasses. You are saved by grace. Don't miss this, that we were the enemies of God. And yet while we were enemies, God said, I'm going to love you and offer you forgiveness. See, don't miss this. The biggest way that Jesus has given and Jesus has been generous is Jesus gave us himself. Jesus gave himself to us. Don't miss that point. The biggest way that Jesus was generous is he gave himself to us. Look what it says in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world in this way. How did God love the world? He loved the world this way that he gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Not only did Jesus come to die on the cross to save you and I, he gives us redemption, he gives us freedom. He gives us salvation. But look what it says in John 1, 12. But to all who did receive him, he gave them the right to be children of God. And to those who believe in his name, not only has Jesus offered us forgiveness and salvation, but he has given us a hope. He has given us a name. He has given us a family. He has given us an eternal hope and inheritance. Jesus has given us so much. If you know Jesus today, you can't deny how generous he has been to you. This is one of the reasons Paul writes this in Philippians 2, 3 through 8. He's writing to Christians, to those who believe in Jesus, to those who follow Jesus. He says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility consider others as more important than yourselves. Everyone should look not to his own interests, but rather to the interest of others. Adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, who existing in the form of God did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. And when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Here's what I want you to see. Write this down. When we see how much we have been given, It's easy to give. When we see all that Jesus has done for us, it's easy to give. And so as I was looking at this and as I was studying, remember I told you I believed a massive lie. I'm looking at this, I'm like, oh, Lord, you have given me so much. You have given me so much. I need to give, but I don't have a lot to give. And this is where I want to transition to our second point. I want to say, what does the habit of generosity look like in our lives? I want to get kind of in the application here. This is the moment that I had when I was studying this. I said, Lord, you have given me so much. I'm compelled to be generous. I have no excuse because you have given me a family, an eternal hope, salvation, forgiveness. But the lie I believed was in order to be generous, I had to have a lot. I had to have a lot of money. I had to have a lot of house. I had to have a lot of influence. I had to have a lot of cars. See, I believe that I had to have a lot of stuff in order to be generous. And the Lord reminded me of this passage of Scripture, and I want to share it with you. It's Matthew 25. 
Here in this passage of scripture, Jesus is teaching his disciples and he's teaching people. And he says, hey, the kingdom of heaven is like this. And so he's talking about the kingdom of heaven. He's referencing this parable to mean the kingdom of heaven and what God has given us. This is what he says. For the kingdom of heaven is just like a man about to go on a journey. He called his own servants and entrusted his possessions to them. To one he gave five talents. To another he gave two talents. And to another one he gave one talent. Depending on each one's ability, then he went on his journey. So this symbolizes Jesus in the kingdom of God. That while we have been saved, God gives us skills and abilities and talents to use to invest for the kingdom of God. So everything we have as believers, our spiritual gifts, our skills, our positions, our influence, we are supposed to take that because it's been given by God in order to make an investment for the kingdom of God. You see, what Jesus says is, hey, I gave some of my servants five talents. I gave some of my servants two talents. And I gave some of my servants one talent. And what I want you to see here is, It's not about the number of talents you have, but about what you do with the talents that God has given you. See, generosity is an all-encompassing lifestyle. And you can be generous with everything that God has given you. And the question is, are you taking what God has given you and are you leveraging it for the kingdom? See, I believe the lie that, man, i got to have a lot of talents in order to make a big difference. And see, the Lord Jesus in this parable I'm about to read to you, he doesn't care how many talents you have. It's about what you do with the talents. Look what he says in Matthew 25, 22 through 23. The man with two talents also approached him. He said, Master, you gave me two talents. See, I've earned two more talents. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You are faithful over the few things. I will put you in charge of the many things. Share in your master's joy. See, the same phrase that he said to the man with five talents, he said, well done, good and faithful servant. See, it didn't matter about the talents. And in this moment, I was like, oh my goodness, I believe the lie that I have to have a lot in order to be generous. And the truth is, you'll see it on the screen. We don't need a lot to be generous. We just need a changed heart. We don't need a lot to be generous, just a changed heart. Generosity is more than an act. It's an added to the heart. I want you to see this in John chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. I just want to show you what God can do, even if you have two talents or one talent. I want to show you what God can do. There's a story where Jesus is about to feed thousands of people, and they're looking for food. They're like, how can we feed all these people? And he says this in John chapter 6. There's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? And Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, so they sat down, and the men numbered about 5,000. Then Jesus took the loaves, and after giving thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also with the fish as much as they wanted. See, Jesus took this little boy's lunch. He was able, it wasn't a lot on its own. It could not feed many people, but Jesus took the little that he had and said, watch what I'm about to do. You might not have a lot of talents, but when you give your talents and your resources to God, you'll be amazed at how many people will be fed with the gospel and the spiritual food that Jesus offers. You will be amazed at what God can do. Don't be that servant that has one talent, that buries everything they have for their own glory and for their own safety. Use what God has given you to make an eternal difference, to make an eternal impact. I already said it once, but I'm going to say it again. Generosity is more than an act. It's an attitude of the heart. Generosity is more than a feeling. It is a lifestyle choice. Let me tell you, remember I said earlier at the beginning of this that I, I, I struggle with generosity? Well, I'm going to tell you just a raw example, an honest example that happened in my life. The day after I met with Pastor Jeff about this sermon and we kind of started talking about things and I knew that I was teaching on and preaching on the habit of generosity, the very next day, my wife and I are headed to something. We're going to some event. I forget what we're going to. Uh, Well, actually, no, I remember, but I'm not going to say it because the people might judge me. But we were going to some type of get-together. And on the way there, we wanted to, my wife's like, we got to stop and pick up this. And I'm like, I don't know about you, but when I'm headed somewhere, the thing I hate the most is to make errands is to stop along the way and waste time to pick up stuff. I hate it. I want to get in the car and go. I'm a one-track mind, A to B, let's get to B. I don't need A.1, A.2, that's not me. And so as we're sitting there waiting, not only do I learn that we have to pick this stuff up, but we're going to have to pay for this stuff. 
for someone else's get-together. And I'm like, Mal, this is ridiculous. We're wasting our time. We're wasting our money. How can we do this? They don't deserve this. And I'm just going off. I mean, I'm just being real. I'm being honest. I was not happy. And I'm just going off. And she said this statement, as I'm so angry about wasting my time, wasting my money on other people who don't deserve it. She goes, well, I love them, and I'm just trying to be like Jesus. And it hit me like a ton of bricks. I said, oh. And she had no idea what I was supposed to preach on in two weeks. And I said, oh. And it hit me. She was giving not based on who they were, but who she was in Jesus. See, God gave to us not based on what we did or what we deserved, but based on who he was. And I'm sitting there having this moment. I'm like, my sermon's being lived out in front of me. And I said, do you know what Pastor Jeff asked me to preach on? She goes, no. I said, the habit of generosity. She goes, oh, I'll make sure to bring my notepad then. (laughs) I said, thanks, babe. It's really helpful and loving. (laughs) But in this moment, I realized it's not about them and what they deserve. It's about him and what he's done in your life. And when you realize that, you realize, man, I need to be generous. And so I want to give us some easy, applicable ways real quick, kind of just bullet point of how we can be generous this week. I want to challenge you. Why don't you try to be generous with your words? Try to be generous with your words. Now, when I say generous with your words, don't be like I was when you're angry and just let it fly. No, encourage someone. Build someone up. Speak a kind word. Tell someone that you love them. Dads, be generous with your words in your family because your words mean more than you know. Moms, be generous with your words to your sons and daughters because your words mean more than you know and they have a greater impact than you know. Some of you be generous with your words by sharing the gospel with someone. Try to be generous with your words this week. Second thing I want to challenge you to do is be generous with our prayers. This is one that I have circled in my notes because this is what I've challenged myself to do. Do you know how I've specifically challenged myself to be generous with my prayers? What it says in Matthew 5, is pray for your enemies, pray for those who, who persecute you. Now, I don't know if any of you have social media. In this time of the election, there is a lot of hate. There is a lot of name-calling. There's a lot of arguing. And I thought, what, what would be greater if we decided to make a habit of praying for our enemies on the other side of the political spectrum? I don't know where you're at on the political spectrum, but what if we decided to say, hey, you know what, till the election, I'm going to pray for those I disagree with. I'm going to pray for those who I think are wrong, who I think are ridiculous. Instead of being so angry and being mad, I'm going to be generous with my prayers. Some of us, we probably need to make a list. No, it's probably not a good idea. But make a list of all those that are your enemies and be generous with your prayers to them. Pray for them. Serve them. Do what Jesus did to you. Next thing I want to try to challenge you with is be generous with your time. We can be generous with our time. Here's a simple way that you can be generous with your time. You could serve here at Christ Place in one of our age-graded ministries. Or you could give your time to serve in the parking lot or to go to the North Campus or to serve on our media team. Whatever it is, you can serve with your time. You could be generous with your time. I'll never forget an, an older man named Gene. He served here for one of our D-Now events that we had over the weekend when I was in student ministry. And I'll never forget, when he showed up, I think he was in his 80s, and, and he had earplugs. And I thought, oh, Lord. He's going to hate our student service. They were a host home. I was like, he's going to hate our service because it's so loud. He brought his own headphones. I mean, his earplugs. Would you believe it? That man was the most excited out of all of our leaders that weekend. He was so excited to have high school boys in his home. He was telling me one night how he had the spread of all the snacks in the world. He had donuts from Krispy Kreme, all this stuff. Do you know what ended up happening? He was so generous with his time to give of his resources. At the end of that weekend, the only two high school boy salvations came from his group. And he was standing there with tears in his eyes. I said, this is why I do it. This is why I do it. I was like, man, you might not think being generous with your time might go a long way, but it can have an eternal impact if you're generous with your time. Next thing is you can be generous with your money. Be generous with our money. You know, there's a lot of needs in our community now. You can either, maybe God is telling you to meet a need in your family, meet a need in your neighborhood. Maybe God's calling you to give through your church for the first time. But don't let money do what it did to me as I was so angry that we were picking up something for someone else. Remember how much you've been given so that you can, it's easy to give when you do that. The last thing I want to say is be generous with our homes. Be generous with our homes. This is another one that I have circled on my list. Pastor Jeff said this statement, I think it's so good. He said, you cannot love where you live without the habit of generosity. 
And see, my wife and I, we just bought a home this past week because we're going to the North Hall because we're going to be in launching the North Campus. And we're so excited. And as we were going up there, we were talking about, man, we bought this house. And I really hope that we have a good neighbor like my neighbor Ryan. See, in my previous neighborhood, there was this guy named Ryan. He lived right across the street from me. And when I first got there, he owned his own heating and air company, had a massive truck, good country boy, always went fishing. And I was like, I'm going to win Ryan to Jesus. And I went over there, and that boy was so fired up for Jesus, he was more on fire for Jesus than I was. Here I am trying to tell him about Jesus, and he's trying to get me saved. I'm like, Ryan, I'm already saved. I'm a pastor at Christ's place. He goes, oh, I go to free chapel. And we start talking. I could offer this man nothing. There's nothing in my life that I could give to him where he would get a return out of it. But you know what he did? He owned his own heating and air company. You know what he did? Anytime I need, needed my uh, machine service or whatever, after a long day of work, he'd show up over there and service all of my air conditioning units for free. And I would try to pay him. He said, no, 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 man. I give because God has given to me. And I was, as we bought this house, I was telling Mal, I said, man, I really hope we could find a neighbor like Ryan. And she said, I really hope we can be a neighbor like Ryan. I said, quit Jesus juking me. <laughs> Stop. But that's another thing we circle. We want to use our home to influence our neighborhood because as Pastor Jeff said, you cannot love where you live unless you're generous. And so I want to be a Ryan in my neighborhood. Why? Because Ryan was like Jesus. To show you how much he was like Jesus, when he heard that we bought a new house, he drove up there this past Thursday and checked all my units. A 40-minute drive. I said, Ryan, you've got to stop. You're making me look bad. He goes, man, I just give because God gave to me. That's how he said it. He's very country. So what do you need to do today? What's that next step that you need to take? What is God calling you to do? Because I would love for you to start practicing the habit of generosity here and now. Generosity is so much more than money. It's a lifestyle. And God has given you something. You might not think it's a lot. But what he has given you has been given to you to use it to further the kingdom as an investment. So what is God calling you to do? To be generous with your words, to be generous with your prayers, to be generous with your time, to be generous with your homes, to be generous with your money? What is God calling you to do? We're moving to a time of response. We're just going to open it up. If you want to come pray for someone, you can come pray. If you want to come down here and say, you know what? I'm going to take that next step, Lord. I'm going to install the habit of generosity in my life. Maybe you online, for the first time, you're hearing that God has loved you so much that he gave his only son. Maybe your first step is to respond to the gift that's been given to you, our Lord Jesus. Because it's impossible to be generous until you realize how much you've been given. Remember, generosity comes from not having a lot, but having a changed heart. And remember our truth. I'm going to leave you with this. Remember our truth. We are never more like Jesus than when we are generous. Would you pray with me? Lord, I'm so thankful that you've given us this opportunity just to open your word and just to see how you are generous and how generosity was a habit in your life. But Lord, you were so generous to us when we didn't deserve it. Lord, this is a staple of the Christian faith that while we were yet sinners, while we were your enemies, you loved us by sending your son. And so, Lord, I pray today that those in the room or maybe someone online, that they would respond to the gospel, that you love them, that Jesus died for their sins. Lord, I pray that those watching online and those in the room, that we would respond to the habit of generosity, that we would declare today that, that we would be generous, that we would love others how you have loved us. Lord, I just ask that you would work and do what only you can do. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand and sing? And if you feel like God is calling you to do something, now is the time to respond.